what I want to kind of talk about today is talking about this, this need or that want to have that specific log that unfortunately we don't have. So this kind of ties in my 80s sad timing music with some of the adversary emulation work that we did with APT actors. So let me take you back in time to kind of where this started. And this goes back a few years, but this is when Mandiant and Microsoft, you, many of you probably remember this, when there was this supply chain attack that was reported using the tool SolarWinds, and it kicked off a thing called Solaragate. Solaragate, however you want to pronounce it. And it combined a couple of different things. It combined this unique uh, supply chain attack, right, which kind of got into this initial access into these environments. But the other part of this attack was also this novel piece where uh, Active Directory, uh, from Azure perspective, was attacked using the Active Directory Federation services, or ADFS, right, which allowed you to kind of log into a, a Windows AD server and basically kind of proxy your connection, for lack of a better way to describe it, I don't want to oversimplify it, up into the cloud. And so that was a unique attack vector. The other part about this was that MFA could be driven around, right? We didn't have the little pop-up with my little uh, my phone to be able to validate me. I could just MF kind of just go right through that. And you started hearing the term Golden SAML, which was originally coined by CyberArk in 2017, start actually gaining some traction, okay? So fast forward a couple months, I'm sitting down, I'm working through trying to build a uh, APT scenario for a blue team uh, CTF. and. I thought, hey, wouldn't it be fun to go ahead and emulate something like this, right? You rip, rip from the headlines kind of thing. And I started thinking about it and envisioning, and I'm like, man, I can go ahead and have all sorts of telemetry because when you build a CTF, you want to have telemetry, right? So, hey, if I have the telemetry, I can write all sorts of great questions for users. They can go ahead and get familiar with cloud environment and the on-prem and the pivot and everything else, and wouldn't that be great? So I sit down, I build my tests, I do my unit testing. I'm not really focused actually on the logs because I kind of feel like I'm in pretty good shape with the logs. And I build the supply chain compromise piece of it. And it was a little light, but that wasn't my focus. Build the on-prem piece. I've got Zeek, I've got insider threat data, I've got Sysmon, I've got all this kind of stuff. I build the pivot, right? That took a little bit of learning curve on my part. Um, and I'll talk about that in a bit to get into the Azure piece. But I get into Azure and I do my cloud attack. And we didn't do tons of stuff in cloud, but just kind of prove out that we could do this and grab some roles and pull some information, et cetera. And I was feeling good about that. I sit down to start writing my questions and I start going through the data that I've got. Man, on premise, I am set. But what about that cloud stuff? All of a sudden, I kind of looked like this guy. I was busy pointing. I'm saying, you know, the landmark down the street over here, I saw that. And I saw the landmark over here to the right, and I saw that. But I had this very, very sinking feeling about this. And I said, well, wait a second. Did I misconfigure my Splunk instance, right? Did I not pull in the right logs? Do I, am I missing something? Well, the show kind of goes on for the CTF. So, you know, kind of set that aside and, and built with it what I had, okay? But post-CTF, I went back and... I'm like, well, let me go ahead and try this. And I was a little bit tinfoil hatty and a little bit concerned about this. So I said, you know what? Let me go ahead and rerun my emulation in Sentinel and see what I get. And I ran the emulation in Sentinel again. And I kind of saw the same things I saw in Splunk. And I'm like, okay, so maybe it's not me. Um, I talked to uh, Dave Cowan, who was the SANS Forensic 509 uh, Cloud Course author about Azure data. And I kind of got a vibe from him that, you know what, I'm probably not far off on what I saw in Splunk and in Sentinel. Fast forward, I'm at the Waywest Hacking Fest. I'm talking about building adversary emulation on a Friday afternoon. I do my presentation. I'm all kind of set to kind of put this thing away and put it to the side. And, you know, I asked for people for questions. And honestly, most of the questions I got was kind of about the logging associated with this and what you could see and what you couldn't see. And I'm like, well, you know what? I talked about emulation, but maybe I need to kind of dial back and look at this specific issue. So I kind of resuscitated this, uh, moved over to Google Cloud. Uh, so I revisited this in Chronicle after I kind of got settled down and got a feel for things. I even went ahead and spun up another Splunk instance and, 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 and looked at it from there. And what I saw across all of these different times running similar scenarios, it's not exactly the same, but, but the similar concepts is that I saw some subtle Subtle changes over time, kind of like a cloud in the sky, right? The cloud changes a little bit over time, but overall, the same kinds of stuff are there. And that's kind of one of the big takeaways of this talk. Okay. Now, this, I'm using the Golden Samuel attack kind of as the case study, so to speak, right? Because not everybody's going to be impacted by, by this. I'm using this to highlight this because once you get into the cloud, that's kind of where the meat of all of this is. But if you do happen to have Golden SAML, ADFS, hopefully you can take some things away from this. 
Microsoft's driving migration to Active uh, Azure Active Directory. Okay, you can see videos on that that Microsoft putting together. They really want people off of ADFS for reasons that have been well documented and things I'll touch on today. But legacy applications can't move overnight, and so we're kind of stuck in this space where the Microsoft Graph and the API that touches you know, Azure and Office 365 and all of the pieces of the Microsoft Cloud environment are out there, but there's also these ways that you can kind of steer through them and get access to different pieces of this. So what I feel like is it's very important to understand what Azure will tell you in terms of logging. And from key changes out there, it does a pretty good job. But if you are a defender coming from an on-premise environment, and you're kind of focusing on this brave new world of cloud, the fidelity of the data that you're gonna get from that cloud provider may not be the same that you are used to in your environment where you're sending up a Sysmon and a Zeek and a, uh, you know, uh, event logging and GPOs and all of those kinds of things. Because if we're gonna go ahead and defend in the cloud, write detections in the cloud and detect, we need to understand this terrain that we're gonna be in, okay? And that's kind of where we're coming from with this, but we're gonna use Golden SAML as our example. So to kind of prove this out, I stood up a Windows 2022 Active Directory running ADFS, kind of the latest and greatest, right? So, I, you know, previously I used other versions of this, but I wanted to make sure I kind of used, you know, everything that they had that was the latest off the shelf, okay? At scale, this would probably be distinct systems, AD servers, Federation servers, you know, all linked together. For my purposes, I collapsed them all in together, okay? I was able to configure ADFS, which is not particularly easy and maybe a separate talk unto itself in terms of how to secure this thing, but Microsoft and there's lots of other sites out there that talk about how to configure this and get it working, communicating. So that was great. Stood up multiple systems and users tied into this environment. I used Azure AD Connect to go ahead and handle that federation between Active Directory and Azure AD. Well, I, well you'll see me say, or you'll probably hear me say low to high. I'm kind of thinking low being on-premise, high being cloud, okay? But basically the idea here is, is that every single user who would access the Azure and M365 environments would log in through the ADFS portal and basically be granted access after they use multi-factor authentication to get into those Azure resources, okay? The other thing I want to call out is Roberto Rodriguez had built this concept called the Simulan Project, and it's out there on GitHub. And it was incredibly helpful for me to understand the initial stages of the attack around the key theft piece of this, and some pointers as to how to emulate this with PowerShell. And that was a really big step for me kind of getting this thing off the ground to go through and do a lot of the work that I was doing here for this. So big thanks there. Now, <clears throat> Another key piece that if you walk away with nothing else and you were talking about needing to monitor your MS's cloud environment, what are some things I could be logging? Well, Azure AD sign-in logs, that's one thing you would definitely want to log. Azure AD audit logs, that's kind of like, hey, I added a key, I created an app. You'll see more about those things in a bit. That's where you'd log that. Office 365 has some robust logging. They actually have their own Azure AD audit, which is a little bit confusing that you have Azure AD audit for Azure Active Directory, and you have Azure AD audit for O365 but that's okay. We'll talk about those things. Good thing to have both. SharePoint Exchange, both have their own audits. There's general audit, which is kind of a catch-all, and then there's DLP if you're using that. And then the security alerts that you have within Microsoft Cloud come out through the Graph API. So like uh, the uh, advanced threat protection, ATP, some of the other kinds of things that you can do, they'll come out through the Graph API. Now, there's also potential sources of noise in this environment. If you're using Azure AD Connect to do that synchronization from that low to high, if you will, those things happen on a regular basis, which is great. So if a user gets created down low, the user gets created up in the cloud. That's a user added um, event that you want to see. However, you're also going to see all the extra noise going back and forth as it's doing its synchronization. So that's something you kind of have to filter through. The Security Compliance Center Data Insights app inside of the Microsoft Cloud, I found this to be incredibly noisy. That may have been my lack of knowledge about it to be able to tune it, but over the time that I played with this over a couple of years, I kind of got one useful alert out of it. So it'd be something I would probably look to either better configure, figure out actually what I can do with it, or just scratch the whole thing because otherwise it's just noise that I have to filter through. All right, so let's talk about the attack path that we're going to go through. This is kind of a five-step attack path. There is one step that is on-premise, okay? So that's the ADFS attack. And then there's the pivot into the cloud, which is the rest of it, okay? We'll talk about ways that we can go ahead, kind of talk about the attack, talk about things that we can do to defend against the different portions of the attack and understand what the logging implications are throughout all of this. All right, so for the first piece, we need to go ahead and, and grab the key, the SAML token, right? So this attack, this portion of the attack would be handled with a local admin account and the ADFS service account. 
And I guess for the good news for folks that are focused on defending the on-premise environment is this is where your classic hunting detection and monitoring would take place. Things like your Sysmon, things like your EDR, or things like Zeek, right? All of those pieces, PowerShell logging, things that you probably are comfortable with in that perspective. There's also a lot of really good content that's also uh, that's already out there for defending your ADFS environment. I especially wanted to point out and call out again, Roberto and Nestori. Nestori is the author of the AAD Internals um, uh, app, uh, which I'll mention a little bit down the road. Actually, we're going to be using it. Um, they did a deeper dive into ADFS attacks and detections, right? So again, if I'm looking to defend at the point to prevent the key from being stolen in the, in the first place, I would definitely look at their link in their documentation, in their uh, documentation, in their uh, in their talk. Definitely a good place to be looking at to understand more about that part of the attack itself. Additionally, Microsoft has put out some guidance around uh, what they are trying to do to help mitigate some of these problems. And there's a little bit of a word soup there. I, I went and highlighted a couple of keywords here, but the long and short of this newer graph API setting that you can set up in your cloud environment to help prevent your keys from being stolen off of your ADFS server is basically, hey, we recommend that you force Active Directory multi-factor authentication every single time Right, so you can't bypass it. So basically what we're saying is if you're using ADFS, you need to turn this on so that you can prevent people from bypassing the multi-factor authentication. That's what the settings basically about. That was in some documentation that Microsoft has that I'll share at the end here. All right, so visibility into this attack. Um, I could go ahead and generate a PowerShell script that would allow me to steal the token, or steal the TFX certificate, enumerate the domain admins and any other users within the environment, as well as object GUIDs, okay? Now, of course, I could be monitoring for script block logging. I could be looking for creation and exfiltration events. I could be looking for the local pipe creation because the ADFS has a local Windows um, internal database that you would connect to to be able to get at this information. So I could be looking for some of these things as well. There's some audit rules that you could employ um, that generate some graph API alerts and some other kinds of pieces there. So there is some visibility into this uh, on-premise part of the attacks, and that's a good thing, okay? However, if those PFX keys get exfiltrated, everything else we're gonna talk about in the remaining 15 minutes of our time here is using an external system, okay? So all the visibility that you would have is then limited to what the cloud provider is providing you from a visibility perspective, because this becomes more of a SaaS uh, type of an attack. Okay, so the keys are gone. I would gonna, wanna go ahead and create a, um, uh, a SAML token and create an access token using the SAML token. So to create my own SAML key, I basically need, um, I basically need four pieces of information. I need to know what your tenant is, okay? Using AAD internals, I can go ahead and issue a uh, call against your domain and get your tenant ID. That law, that, that, that query is not something that's gonna be logged in the graph, at least not in something that you could see. Okay, so I can go out and go ahead and say, hey, tell me your domain, give me, your, uh, give me the tenant ID. You would not see that. The object GUIDs. The object GUIDs are something I went ahead and exfiltrated when I grabbed the PFX key, right? That was stuff I took off of the ADFS server. That would be my users, right? I'm gonna use those to craft a SAML token. Once I have those GUIDs, I can impersonate whoever I want to. I have my PFX certificate. And then finally, I need an issuer. The issuer just running a get ADFS properties at the server would go ahead and give me that information. Again, I could put that in my PowerShell script to grab all those pieces of information. Once I have those pieces of information for my SAML token, I need to build an access token. Now the access token is logged, it's a logged event, um, but notice here I've got two different log events, one for Tim and one for Heather. They are my two domain admins, right? Because I swapped the GUID in for my SAML token, I can log in as Tim, I can swap it out, build another SAML token, create the access token for Heather. Doesn't matter, everything else is the same. I'm logging into an app called Azure Active Directory PowerShell, which is a system, uh, externally system viewed app that's, that's there for a specific purpose, um, but obviously could be abused in this circumstance. The other thing I wanna call out there is notice that I have a successful login event and it says MFA requirements are satisfied by claim. Notice I didn't do anything with my phone. I didn't do any multi-factor authentication, but I have that SAML certificate. I didn't flip that newer API setting on. And so I just drove right by it. 
So if I want to go ahead and detect or look at things to kind of say, hey, what, what's happening here? Um, this Azure app, Active Directory PowerShell, or Azure Active Directory PowerShell, isn't something I would expect to see people logging into on a regular basis. So if I see that and that published app ID you being utilized over and over again, that's something I probably want to push on. Okay, um, all of the login events from Azure, whether it's O365 logins or Azure logins, have IP addresses in them. Um, that your mileage varies in other parts of the logging, but in the sign-in logs, that's always there. Obviously, I could start doing some login analysis from that perspective, and then I also want to look at some trailing activity after the login happens, which is what we're going to talk about next. Once I get in and I have an access token, if I want to be able to go ahead and do some stuff, I need to go ahead and set up some permissions. So I need to configure access within Azure itself. Okay. To do that, I can do one of two things. I can go ahead and create an application, or I can go ahead and leverage an existing application. Again, from a landmark perspective, creation of applications, creation of service principles, those are separate logged events. They happen. If I do it in the UI, they happen together, but there's two separate logged events. If I script it, I can create one, but then have to do the other as well. But again, it's all things that are logged along the way. Okay. From a permission perspective, there are a published set of permission references. I have the reference link there. They are outputted in GUIDs. Um, so this gets, allows me to go ahead and say, what are the permissions that this request, this access token is going ahead and gathering into the application? Now, you might be thinking, why do I need to have permissions and applications? Well, the permissions and applications are kind of a key thing that anything, any tool is using to be able to gather logging. I can tell you from my perspective, if I want to go ahead and gather O365 and Azure logs in Chronicle, I'm going to have an app that I'm going to pull this information through. I can tell you Splunk does the same thing. I can see, tell you Zscaler has app, application configuration because I found their application uh, in setup instructions to go ahead and integrate with Azure, right? So this, uh, this app and permission structure is a very, very common thing within Azure. Okay. The last step of my process here is around administrative consent, consent, easy for me to say, or delegated permissions. There are two different kinds of permit, um, grants. You can have an application or you can an application permission or delegated permission. For the purpose of this attack, we're using delegated permissions, but obviously you might be able to go ahead and do some other kinds of things with application permission. I just haven't played around with that. From this perspective, I can also have a logged event. So when I say, hey, I want to go ahead and give administrative consent for the directory read write all, um, it's going to go ahead and create a logged event there. Now, notice here, it's actually spelling out the specific permissions that you're getting these delegated permission grants for as well. Um, but not all permissions require that admin consent. You can see them on the UI. Some of them say yes, some of them say no. That's also in the documentation. What I want to highlight about this configure access piece is, is that I need to have permissions and administrative grants to really do the next kind of things and really get out the data. But you'll notice that if I look at this from an API perspective, the creation of an app, the service principle, and the admin consent are all post, uh, post posts in the API. The permissions are a patch. However, if I wanted to enumerate the applications that are out there, if I want to enumerate the permissions, those are gets. Those gets are not logged in the graph API. So if I get in there with an access token, I start poking around your environment to say, hey, tell me what applications are out there. Tell me what permissions I have. Until I actually create something or add a permission, those things are not logged, at least not to the defender to be able to see that uh, reconnaissance happening, right? And so that's a big difference than things that we're normally used to. All right. So if I wanted to start monitoring and pushing on this one, where could I be looking? Well, from an application perspective, I probably want to know what applications should be in my Azure environment. Having a fairly tight leash on that would probably be a good thing. But don't count on application creation being a, a sign of badness or the absence of it being a sign of goodness, right? The service principle, I didn't see a lot of things I could really extract off of that, but the permission assignment's a powerful one, right? I have a list of GUIDs. I could go ahead and be looking for greedy permission grabs. I could be looking for somebody coming back more and more and adding more and more permissions. I could be looking for specific permissions around specific parts of the graph API that are, people are going after. So those are all good things to be able to pivot on. Similarly, the, dele uh, the delegated permission grant with admin consent both for Azure AD and O365, put that out in Word, so it's kind of friendly for somebody to look at versus a GUID. But, you know, that's another place I could be looking. But I really like the permission assignment as being a place to kind of really hone in on there. 
So once I get through, now I want to establish persistence. Why do I want to establish persistence? Well, we talked about that Azure Active Directory PowerShell being a system exposed app. And if I keep coming back to that over and over, that might be suspicious. But what I can do inside of an app is I can create a client secret or a certificate or a federated credential. Client secret's kind of the lowest lying thing. It's the easiest thing to be uh, to do because those access tokens that I have are only good for 60 to 90 minutes. Microsoft says it averages 75. I can tell you having played around with this a number of times, yeah, that's pretty much it. So I need to recharge that token, if you will, from time to time. Well, what's a good way to recharge that token? Well, creating a client secret, okay? And then when maybe my initial access ends, I can go ahead and recreate my SAML token, okay? And I say recreate because maybe I wanna log in as a different person. If I've got object GUIDs, I could go ahead and switch out the object GUID for Tim for Heather, or maybe just some other random user because I'm looking at the CEO's information or the CFO's information and put their object GUID in instead and log in as them. I encode the SAML token. I log into my app this time, right? Rather than the PowerShell app. I go ahead and use the client secret that I just created and I get a new access token that's good for another 75 minutes. That's all very easily scripted. And the reason I say it's very easily scripted is I was able to script it. So if I can script it, you can script it. Anybody can script it. Um, the login event looks something like this. Everything else is pretty much the same. The pieces I highlighted is on the right-hand side was the original system login that I went through the Azure Active Directory PowerShell, and it has that known app ID. On the left is my app that I created or that I leveraged within the victim environment, and it has its own app ID. Otherwise, everything is the same unless I decided to change to a different user. And I'm in. Co. Cool. What could I do with this? Well, from a client secret perspective, I could probably want to be looking and saying, do I expect as a matter of policy, client secrets being created inside of apps? Client secrets, just like everything else is a landmark, right? That's created, uh, that's a logged event. So you'll see that, right? There are expirations you can set on those secrets. Um, you know, maybe you're looking for extensively long um, timeframes on those, right? That might be something to consider as well looking for anomalous logins to certain apps, right? That's not gonna happen day one, but if you have apps that are set up through the environment for specific purposes, and all of a sudden maybe there's some permission changes to them and somebody's logging into those apps that aren't generally being utilized in the past, that might be something to look at as well, right? So we start getting into anomalous logins, which again, is something we probably do on premise, but we're doing it in a different way in the cloud, okay? The last part of this is the actions on objective. And so, you know, if with time for time's sake, I'm probably not gonna go through all of the different examples here, but I'll kind of hit some high level points around this. Um, I started off writing this slide and making a very declarative statement saying no visibility into the get commands to the API. And then I had to stop and I put a little asterisk next to that because I wanted to kind of adjust that ever so slightly, okay? Once I'm into the system and I wanna say, tell me who the users are in my Azure environment, that's not a logged event. If I wanted to say, who are the ones with the global admin role? Not a logged event. If I want to say, which token am I using? What mailbox rules does this user have? Who are the contacts? Who are their calendars? What does their license look like? What are their OneNote pages? Tell me about the folder and file structure that they have. None of those things are logged. If I say enumerate the mail messages, the message IDs, however, are enumerated, right? So I get the output, I can see the subject lines and, and maybe the body of the emails. Uh, the defender will get message IDs being enumerated. Okay, so there is visibility there. If I go ahead and preview your OneNote page, okay, you're not necessarily gonna say, hey, it was this page in the notebook, but it'll be, you know, projects.1. So it'll tell you that. So it's not a it's not a, an absolute nothing, but it's not as much of that visibility that maybe we would come to expect as people start poking around in our environments. Um, you get, if you go ahead and add somebody to a role, um, and this is kind of goes into these continual changes that are happening out there. Um, you know, in the, uh, let me slide that out of the way. There we go. Um, if you get into the, um, uh, the roles, right? Uh, roles will log, right? So I add somebody as an exchange administrator or a global admin. Those things are logged all the time, but Privilege identity management was something that had, got added into Azure AD Audit since April of 2023. So this is, again, I still see these things that are happening in the logs themselves. This was not a configuration change. This started just appearing to me a few minutes after those kinds of things are executed in the environment. So that was a new thing. Uh, I just thought that was an interesting thing to call out that Microsoft decided to add that in because I didn't make a configuration change to accommodate that. Um, 
roles, much like everything else, have known GUID IDs, right? So if you care about the Exchange admin being given to somebody or the SharePoint admin given to somebody or the global admin, absolutely security admin as well, right? Those different GUIDs, I would absolutely want to be monitoring for those changes as well. But the enumeration pieces aren't there. So you really need to focus on those change events, those ads, deletes, and everything else. Which brings us to this. O365 logs a heck of a lot of different things, both on the uh, user creation and the Azure pieces of this, as well as obviously the O365 pieces. Uh, OneDrive does log quite well. If I was trying to read a file, download, upload, move, delete, folder creation, create a share, anonymous share used, those are all loggable events. So that was really good. Actually, I was pretty happy with that. Um, the Graph API doesn't do a lot of things. It does a lot of that security ATP kinds of stuff or some security events. I went ahead and kind of, you know, created a secure, had a security event trigger and I went in and went ahead and updated it, marked it as a false positive and closed it out. That was the older API for Windows security event that would generate a Graph API alert. But there's some other things that are happening there as well. Whoop. From a visibility perspective, you're probably thinking, well, if I'm going to monitor these environments, what kinds of data should I monitor with? If you have one choice, O365 is the way to go. Realistically, though, you want to hedge your bets and utilize all of the all four of these that I've listed here. The Azure sign-ons are going to be duplicative of O365, but that's okay. You never know if something else is going to change and get added. The Azure Active Directory audits is a little bit different, but pretty close. The PIMs were one little different thing. If I was doing this to scale, the Graph API would be Pluto, O365 would be the Sun, but there's still good stuff coming out of the Graph API. At the end of the day, what's important to understand is that we're accustomed to have CRUD, right? Create, read, update, delete. Really, we have a duck. We have delete, update, and create, okay? The uh, adversary can build this stuff. They can test it out. They can script it. They can go ahead and attack much more seamlessly, I guess is probably the best way to put it. And that recon stuff that we're kind of used to in our on-premise environments just really isn't quite there as much as we might be used to. Um, this also makes the damage assessments tough because we kind of have to assume that once we see one thing happening, all the other things are potentially compromised at that point. And so that's a little bit tricky. Lots of uh, additional reading you can check up on. I highly recommend all of these different pieces around this to learn more, particularly if you're using ADFS in the environment, but lots of other goodness there just to kind of keep your eyes on. And I know I'm about at time. I wanted to thank everybody. You can find me on all of these different places. Um, happy to engage with anybody. I'll also be in the room afterwards. Um, but this was fantastic and uh, look forward to chatting with you further about this. Mm -hmm.